pictures, I think of a message that has been put in a way that I can understand. For example, if you grew up in Pastor Willie's time and uh, where, where he was, because he always gives us an, those examples, when he, they speak of the parable of the sower, you understand agriculture. You know that there is planting, there's where you plant and seed doesn't grow, there's where you plant and seed grows. And you know the difference, that it is the soil that is making the difference, it's the nurturing of, of, the, of the plant. So we, we are able to relate. You can't forget the parable of the sower. You may not understand other things, but you know there is soil, there is seed, there is planting, there is what grows and what doesn't grow, isn't it? And so today we continue in that truth. And we turn, we continue with the scripture in Matthew 13. We're going to start from verse 24. I am going to do this a little bit different. We are going to read Matthew 13 to tw uh, 24 to 29, and we will jump to Matthew 36, 43, and if time allows, we'll double back. Yes? So please be with me as we, as we, as we, we go through this. I am using the New King James Version, if you will project it. Matthew chapter 13, Verse 24, and I'll read. It's the parable of the wheat and the tares. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the grain went, but when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, lest, you, lest while you gather them, lest while you gather the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the, t at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in a bundle, in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Let's go to 36. 36. The scripture tells us, you know, he always gave parables generally and always took his people away to explain it. Then Jesus, said to the, then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house and his disciples, his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom and daughters. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of age. And the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all the things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous one will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let them hear. And that is the word of the Lord. Father, we thank you for your truth that is unchanging and yet continuously changes us. As we listen, my King, speak to us. Open the eyes of our hearts to see, picture what you want us to see. Open our spiritual ears to hear you. Lord, put at bay anything that would distract us from hearing your truth. Speak, we your servants are listening. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's take a moment and break down the parable of the, so, of the wheat 
and tear in concepts or picture forms that we can be able to relate to and understand. Not that we are not understanding or relating, but things that will help us to remember. One, the honor. I want us to pick out some of the things that are standing out. One of the things I noticed is the honor. We all own things, right? We are, you own a pen, a phone, a car, Futsubishi for some of us, but you own something. Also, we think. In verses 24, 27, 37, I noticed that he started with, um, when he was speaking, he started, the kingdom of God is like a man who sowed. And then as he went on, he, he was categorical. It wasn't any other man. It was the owner. So it wasn't someone that um, I got to learn here in Kenya that you can hire a piece of land and plant and then you give it back after some time. It wasn't that kind. It wasn't hired land. He was the man and the man was the owner. The field was his, which means he cared what went into the field. He cared how the field was taken care of and he cared about the output of the field. He cared what the results will be. But I want us to keep that in mind, that it wasn't just a hired person. It wasn't just someone that had hired the land and didn't care how it would turn out. It was someone that owned it and so cared about it. And then verses uh, 38 tells us that the field is the world. The sower owns the field, and the field is the world. Are we together this far? Yes? So, who is the owner who owns the world? Now, majority of us, with the, way, with the way things are going outside there, we will be quick to go to 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this age. Eh? We, will quick, we will be quick to interpret it the way it will fit us, but thank God for grace. He's very clear. I don't mean Minister Grace, I mean the grace of the Lord. Amen? Yes, he's very clear in saying who the owner is. So Jesus Christ, our Lord, says in verse 37 that the owner who sowed the good seed is the owner of the world and he is the son of man. So it is not the God of this age. No, it is the son of man who is our Lord Jesus Christ that owns the field and the field is the world. So before we go to Shakahora or wherever and believe that the man of God owns the world, you know, the man of God owns our blessing, the man of God owns, please, let's, 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 let's stick to this scripture. Who owns the world? Who owns what you're going to go to lay everything that you own at the feet of money to give you? They don't belong to him. Don't, don't, don't come and cause our man to, the man of God to fall here, eh? And you say, Pastor Willie has my blessings. Pastor Willie, you know, if, he, if I give him this, I'll get this. Okay, he does not own anything in this world. Actually, he's owned by God. So are each one of us. Amen? Okay, let's continue. So, we have the owner. He owns the field. The field is the world. And that owner has a name, has a title, the son of man. Did you know that throughout the Gospels, Christ refers to himself as the Son of Man 84 times, just in case we forget. Just in case you forget it in Matthew, you'll find it in Mark as you go to look for John. Hmm? That is how I understood the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, go and look for John. You know? So in case you forget it in Matthew and you miss it in Mark, get Luke so you can go and look for it in John. You will find it there 84 times. So what is the timeless truth here? In every biblical teaching, we have the timed and timeless truth. So how, how is this helping us, knowing who the owner of the field is? When we know, the timeless truth is this, Jesus is the good sower, the owner of the world, we are but stewards. We will do well to remember who owns the world because when we don't when we don't understand who owns the world when we don't understand who owns the things that we seek from man we will abuse the things that we have received you will abuse your family you will abuse your job 
You'll abuse the resources because you think you own them, so you'll use them any way you feel like. But when you understand who owns, it makes a difference. That is the timeless truth. It will not change. It doesn't matter how many billions you have. You don't own them. You are but a steward. So how are you stewarding the life that you own? The phone that you have? The shoes that you wear? Every aspect of your life, we are just stewards. Concept two, we have the enemy. And that we will find in verses 25 and 39. We are living in a dispensation where we are living in two extremes. It's either good. Actually, we are living in extremes of everything is bad, everything is ours, everything. We, there is no place for truth. That truth is becoming subjective. Our, our facts are becoming truth. And when we think we can tilt truth to fit how we want. And that is not, not the case. And unfortunately, when it comes to the enemy, it has grown so big that false hope is being held onto. We ignore the evil one that is running rampant and we blame the next person. We cling on to the men, of, the men of God instead of the God of the men. In these verses, our Lord, the owner of the field, Jesus Christ, says he has an enemy. And we cannot understand the world as it is without taking into account the enemy and his work. Christ does not leave the identity of his enemy for us to guess. It is not Martin. It is not Jenny, it is not your neighbor, it is not your relative in the field, in the, in the village that you don't like, that they will tell you, that one is, is bewitching you, that one does not, that, that is your enemy. No, it is not your co-worker who you are saying, Lord, if, he, if that person crosses me one more time, Jesus, scandal, first deal with this person properly. That is not your enemy. Jesus acknowledges who the enemy is and he tells us clearly in verse 39, he says that his enemy is the devil. And our enemy is working tirelessly to make sure that we point at other people. But Jesus is telling us, listen, there is an enemy. If he acknowledged the presence and work of the enemy, we lie to ourselves if we do not. We lie to ourselves and we position ourselves for defeat if we ignore that the enemy exists. I'm not saying go worship him, but you cannot ignore his presence. Jesus did not. Here is the truth. If we do not acknowledge the enemy that is at work among us, we will go to war with the wrong person. We will war with the wrong arsenal. I don't mean the team, I mean the weapons. And we will be defeated without a doubt. So what is the truth that we are taking from here? Christ did not say that he had enemies. He said an enemy. The enemy. I, I think he knew plurals at that time. He could have said enemies. But he said enemy. Why? Because he will masquerade in any form. He will use vessels just like in the kingdom of God. But he's just one. It was not the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, then. And right now, it's not going to change just because you don't like the person next to you. That person is not the enemy. The enemy is the devil. So before you launch an attack, can you understand the enemy behind the vessel? What would be our response today to this truth? To not underestimate the power and the work of his enemy. His power is great. His work is vast. It took and still takes the finished work at the cross to put him in position. Do not, do not underestimate the one that is seeking, that has been seeking from eternity to destroy the kingdom of God. 
the seed, number three. In the first parable of the sower, the seed was the word of God that fell on different grounds that stood for our hearts. However, that is not the case in today's parable. The scripture tells us that the seed are the sons of the kingdom who are to grow wherever they are planted, regardless of the mixed multitude. Two sowers, meaning two kinds of seeds, that is the sons of the kingdom of God, being the good seed, and the sons of the evil one, who are the weed. You will know who the son of the kingdom is. We were learning about the kingdom of God versus religion. And Pastor, Pastor, Pastor Jotham said, in, the kingdom of, in, in, in every kingdom, there is rule and reign. You will understand who you belong to or who the next person belongs to, depending on who is reigning in their lives. So the sons of the kingdom are under the rulership and the lordship of God in every aspect of their lives. And it's the attitude of our hearts and the response that we give that will determine and will showcase who we are. So what is the truth in this? John 10 verse 10 tells us that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But that he, our Lord, came that we may have life and have it abundantly. The enemy sows weed in Christ's field. Let us not be blinded. He doesn't go to sow anywhere else. The enemy is not in the club. That is already his field. He's among us. Martin, it's not me now. Don't look at me like that. And he's like, are you the enemy right now? Mm -mm. I would like to believe I am not. He is not in the... He is? Did he, where, did, where did the enemy go to sow? In the field of the owner. And we know who the owner is. The owner is Christ. So the enemy is sowing seed among us. Let us not forget. Let us not be blinded. And because we come and sing and we lift our hands holier than, the, um, holier than the Catholic Pope. No, it's not working like that. He's among us. And we lie to ourselves if we think he's outside. Because then we expose ourselves to his attack without putting into account to be armored up. Why? Because we think he's outside. Weed and seed might look alike. But time reveals what each one is. So what is the response that is expected from us today? To be alert. The enemy's goal is to frustrate the growth of the good seed. And if he doesn't succeed then, his desire is to target the end results to destroy the harvest. The other day I was in a cab and we were talking about that right now, the hopelessness that is there, that people are going and believing a lie. I mean, you go, you starve yourself, you worked many years and you starve yourself to die and bring whatever it is that you own. Why would I send you to pray and fast and go and meet Jesus? When me I don't want that is the blinding. That is the enemy at work that we ignore. You cannot tell me that if I do this and this, it will lead me closer to God and you stay outside of that working. You, you cannot ask me to do what you're not willing to do. And yet, that's the dispensation that we are in. That the enemy has taken... You know the enemy doesn't... They say he's the father of lies, right? That is biblical. But the enemy distorts the truth. He's not original. He's a counterfeit. So if we do not acknowledge his presence, he will sound. We will not pay attention to how he speaks, what he does, to distinguish that from the truth. 
And before we know it, we will be the next people that are going to be picked. Now I don't know from which valley we shall be. I thank God for Trinity. I thank God for grace that I get to see, to sit and actually hear the word and censored. Whether I want to, to hear it that way or not, the truth is still spoken. Last Sunday when Pastor Willie was speaking, I told God, it would have been easier if you called me in private, told Pastor Willie, you know, give this message to Pastor Shan. He, we would be fine. You don't have to go exposing, exposing my drama outside. That's the truth that convicts and comforts. I left convicted and in my silence I was comforted as I held on to the truth. Do not ignore the presence of the enemy. Number four. The field which is the world. The field is not the church as some of us have translated it to, to mean. Christ clearly says that the field is the world. The good seed in the field, the good seed is planted in the field, and those are the sons of the kingdom planted in the world, not the reverse. We are planted in the world, not the world planted in us. It is the church in the world where the enemy is rampant. And if we do not hold on to the truth, if we do not allow ourselves to grow where we are, we give the enemy the chance to plant and grow where he shouldn't. We are the good seed. The world is vast. He has planted us for a reason, for a season, and is coming to harvest. You're not in Trinity by mistake or coincidence. You're not in Mirema, Ruisambu, by chance. I'm not in Kenya by human design. I've been planted. Number five, good with evil. The verse asks a question that continues through generation, a question that many, if not all of us, have had or even asked. With the finished work of the cross, why is there still so much evil happening? Why is there good and evil? He finished. I mean, at the cross he said, it is finished then why do bad things still happen? Why is there still evil in the world? Well, why do people have bad hair days? Are there no saloonists? For women, why do we let our nails get to a point where we are wondering how, but where? I fight with my sons every day, that hair, that hair. Sometimes I, I want to, la to buy a machine when they are sleeping, I go and fast and run through the head and just, is it because there are no barbers? They are there. Evil is happening because the finished work of Christ is not being accepted by everyone. Evil is still happening because the church is out of position. The good seed is comfortable being with the good seed. The good seed is quick to pull out the tears and in the process pulling out the good seed. Evil is still happening because we are fallen. 
evil is still happening because we think we have arrived. Evil is happening because the good are silent. Christ at the cross comes with grace. At the end of time will be Christ the judge. We are living in the year of the Lord's favor. Heading to the day of vengeance. Let the wheat and the tear grow together. At season time, at, at harvest time, there will be, right now, we are growing together. The year of the Lord's favor, we are in the period of grace. But a time is coming when the harvest has to take place. So what truths do we have to remember from today? From the verses that we've read. Verses 13, chapter 13, 30, it says, let both grow until the harvest. In the parable of the wheat that we've just read, Jesus gives an, exp an, exp um, an illustration to expose the tactic of imitation and infiltration that the enemy uses. I love, a while back, my mother asked me, before actually I got ordained, he, uh, she asked me, before I stood here to speak and preach and God called me to be his mouthpiece in terms of scripture, I taught what we called madrasa. I taught women the Quran and the truth of Islam. And on Fridays, Juma, as the men are having their discussions, I'll sit with the women. It's my gift. Where I use it, I can. I either speak for him or I don't. I didn't know any better. And she asked me, you know the truth. Why would you walk away from it? And I said, I know the truth. That's why I walked towards it. It's because I know both sides. It's not that someone has brainwashed me. No. I studied. I didn't just study it outside school. I did it in school from my, you call it form one to form six. It's, it's who I was. And he said, oh, but now you know the truth. You have taught it. I mean, how, how do you walk away from it? I know the truth. And so I walk towards it. He said, let them both grow together. The tares, when they are planted, and wheat is planted, when they are growing, they look exactly the same. They look exact. You cannot differentiate as they begin to sprout. They look the same. And so, if you pull out the wheat because you have somehow been able to distinguish, you will pull out. You, if you pull out the tares, you pull out the wheat because the roots, most times, will be together or kind of crisscrossing. So when you pull, you will destroy both. So you're telling them, let them grow together. However, with time, the wild weed will show itself to be a plant that could uproot the wheat if pulled. The owner of the field did not permit servants to uproot the weed. Instead, he told them to let them grow till harvest. Satan has followed this, this pattern very well in his attacks against the church. He has flooded the market with imitations. There are several examples in scripture. In Exodus, the magicians, whichever, when, when Moses uh, turned the, when the road into a snake, when the turning of waters of the Nile into blood, bringing forth plagues, and you can find that in Exodus, we will not go there, Exodus chapter 7, uh, up to 8.15. In Acts, we see, Acts 9, Acts 8, 9 to 24, the sorcerer Simon imitating Philip. In First Peter 5.8, the scripture tells us, 
to be sober, to be vigilant, because our enemy, the devil, walks about like a rolling, roaring lion seeking whom to devour. Like, not the. There's a difference between a lion and the lion of Judah. There's a difference that he might look like, he might sound like, but he is not. The enemy imitates. He creates a facade. And so when you are quick to, res to react, you respond yourself into destruction. So he's saying, wait, don't pull them out. Give them time. Give them time. I was sitting with someone wise a while back. And me and my decision were like this. Because I felt like now here, and I was told, give it two days, give it three days, breathe, relax. It will come to the surface. And in my head I'm thinking, are you getting me? Are you getting the frustration? Are you getting where I am right now? If I let it linger, I have a feeling it might cause me more drama. Like, mm -mm. And they checked on me the next day. So did you do some? No, I haven't. That's good. Did you? No, I haven't. And as things came to the surface, I had the clarity to make the right decision. Let them grow together. For as long as we are on this side of heaven, evil will grow alongside the good until the return of Christ. That is the teaching of Jesus. And we need this wisdom if we are to sustain a lifetime of ministry. Because we need to understand the nature of the world in which we are living. I have a question for us today. Is the world getting better? Or is it getting worse? The world is getting better and the world is getting worse at the same time. The good seed is growing. Harvest is in abundance as the truth is proclaimed. However, so are the seeds. With every passing moment, both are growing larger, more deeply rooted than ever before. Every time there is a rise, there is a revival. There's always something that is rising up against the church. Today we have LGBTQ. As we stand firm and start declaring truth, we have some facts that are crowding the truth. They're seemingly louder than the truth. And yet with time, we know that truth will prevail. We have Pastor Jotham coming here every Friday, the kingdom of God versus religion. And on the other side, there's also another man of God that is telling people, go fast until you die and go and meet Jesus. Truth, good seed, bad seed, and both are gaining ground. Is it a lie? No. You may even find... Uh, the Shakahora people, even right now, if it were possible, the church would be open and it would be full. Because we are ignoring the presence of the enemy. And us who know the truth, who have the hope that does not disappoint, we keep it in these boundaries that people go to look for hope elsewhere that has no business giving them hope. At harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But, to ga but gather the wheat into my bands. I'm going to say something that is contrary to what we would normally say at here or what you've heard or talked about. Do not be concerned about pulling out the weed. It's none of your business. It's not yet time. Right now, he told them, let them both grow. Our mandate is not to go looking for weed to, to pull it out. 
our mandate is to grow and blossom and thrive and declare truth where we have been planted so that the lie, the bad seed does not gain ground. The owner told the servants to let them both grow until harvest time. Today is the day of grace. Today is not the day to pull out the weed. The day to pull out the weed, which is the judgment day, is coming. But still then, the good seed, the good wheat, the body of believers continues to grow side by side with non-believers. Judgment belongs to our, Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ. Right now, just like the wheat mixed with the weed grew, he is calling us to live and grow in this world until he comes. Grow where you are planted. Time will reveal and all will be brought to account. Don't be fo so focused on doing God's work that you forget your mandate. What are the timeless truths to live by? Grow and flourish where you're planted, number one. There are seasons in our lives where we wish we were someone else. I know I have had those seasons. When we question whether we are where we are supposed to be, I have been there. Maybe you look around you and all you see is weed and are tempted to uproot the weed. Better yet, uproot yourself. That is where I have been. Very tempted to uproot myself as if I'm good and gone plant myself in another soil. Truth is you and I are not meant to grow, only to grow. We are meant to flourish. We are meant to thrive where we are planted. So let's not be on a mission to withdraw from the world. There is no perfect place on this side of heaven. Christ sows his people, and so does Satan. Where, God, where has God planted you? Get rooted. Grow. If this season God has you at Trinity, do what you need to do. Do what he has called you to do. A time is coming when we'll be called to account. Tolerance and forbearance. When I was, when I was reading um, the verse, Matthew 13, 30, let them both grow, where I'm getting the first time, these two timeless truths, I, I thought of the word tolerance. And, I, and with, with time, the word tolerance has changed meaning. We think to tolerate someone is to accept even the wrong. You know, we are tolerating. But really, tolerance means to have patience, to have patient self-control, to have restraint, not to just accept and compromise, but to give grace as, as you believe, as you look towards the change. That is what tolerance is. Today, when that word is used, we are affirming what others affirm. You know, maisha niyangu. You know, he has chosen. That's, that's their life. It is okay. As long as it doesn't affect me, we are good. But in the kingdom of God, everything affects you. Because the, your, the life that you live is not your own. For as long as you have confessed with your mouth that Christ is Lord, you, it is him that lives. So whatever is happening with, around, and in your life affects eternity. It has to answer to the cross. Let us not confuse tolerance with passivity or giving up on another person's spiritual well-being. In my family, we have meetings, meetings of laughing, meetings of celebrating, and meetings of fighting. It is part of life. 
And in one of those meetings, two of my children told me, I was telling them, me, I'm going to leave you for God. And they said, mm -mm. me, you cannot leave me for God. Me, deal with me, Kivyangu. Just come and deal with me. One of them was like, if you feel I'm not getting well, okay, throw something at me and put me back into, into my life. Don't, I'll, don't be passive when it comes to me. Don't be passive. But we have look, taken tolerance to mean passive. And so we let things slide. LBGTQ. Me, if, as long as you're not in my space, I, what if they see me talking to that person and then they also think I am? What if Pastor Shan passes like this and knows that that person is, these days even they, they, they people who feel like they are cups, so you leave them to be cups. I, I still don't understand the sexual part of it. I identify as a cow, I'm a cow. I identify as a plate, I'm a plate. There's nothing you can do about it. But if you're in my personal space, <laughs> as God is my witness, I'll remind you I don't use you for food. I will not be passive about certain things. No, I refuse. So it is okay to tell someone, look, I hear you, but that is foolish. Even a bull does not go with a bull. You who has a brain and you're with God, and you're in the image of God, how do you confuse yourself to be an animal? It is okay to tell the truth. It is okay, even as they both grow, to still speak the truth. As long as we are still in this field, the wheat needs to grow. Always remember the mission of the church is sowing seeds, not pulling weeds. We have a big enough challenge on our hands, trying to deal with sin in our own hearts, our own families, and our own churches. It is not in our power or calling to root it out of the world. That is the work of Christ when he comes. It is our mandate to sow the seed. Matthew 13, 43 says, the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. The timeless truth here is the time of harvest is sure. In Islam, when you die, that is your day of judgment. And um, God, Allah, still has the prerogative to throw you wherever he feels like, regardless of the life you lived. If you, it is he, you can't question him, right? So if, if, if you have been doing bad, bad, and then maybe along the way you did good or you have died and they have buried you because they pray for the dead and God gives you Jana Firdaus, you're fine. You know, you never know. He may, he may in our prayers after you've died, shift you and gives you Jana Firdaus. <laughs> Jesus is saying here, that is not how it's going to work. You're choosing today where you're going to end up. We are not going to spend years after you have died praying for God to shift you. It is not going to happen. You have chosen to shift yourself right now. The cross is there and he's saying to him that believes you've been given your eternal life. So we are not going to be here and say, huh, you see, even when he harvests, while you're being bundled up with the tears, there is a possibility that as we pray for you, Allah will have mercy on you and put you with the wheat. Sulfur, hellfire is burning well, 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 waiting for each one of us that chooses to be the tear. There is no, there is no otherwise. Let me, Pasi, they may tell you not to give me this mic again. Hell is real. If you've been by, burnt by candle fire, you know that it is painful. Martin, you choose to be a tear right now. No prayer. Once you're bundled like this, the fire that is going to deal with us is still doing push-ups. Judgment day, the harvest time is sure coming. None of us. You can miss to be born. You can miss to live. But death is an appointment each one of us is going to keep. 
and you do not know when you're going to die. I might be living here and I collapse there. You do not know. And when it's time for harvesting, he has said he's sending out his servants, his angels. It's not going to be your pastor, your BFF, your relative, your mother, your wife, your husband. Your... The one that is coming to do the harvest is incorruptible. I tell you jokes. He will not know any jokes. Jokes are ending here. Akuna jokes, youths. Akuna jokes. Everything that causes sin, all who do evil, there will be no room for explanation, my people. There is no room. Now is our time. Now. In Matthew, 12, 20, in Matthew 12, 30, Christ says, whoever is not for him is against him. There is no middle ground. Try and keep peace here. Oh, this time you're here because you want someone to, you want to offend you here. If you have accepted Jesus Christ, you are an offense. In case we have forgotten, you proclaiming Christ as Lord and Savior is an offense in itself. So if you're looking to be liked by someone that does not get, get that concept, You'll be waiting for a very long time. And when the harvest comes, you'll be those ones that God said, though they call me Lord, Lord, I do not know you. But I, but, but I, led, but I led worship. But, but God, you have to understand, I pre even, even I preached, I even did exposition. Eh? I was a pastor. Eh? Mr. Grace, I was even married to the, to, the, to, the, to the founder, to the pastor, the person you gave the vision. Eh? How, how do I miss this? You, you have to understand. That role was very hard. Being the pastor's wife, I, being in with the women, I had somehow to be up cut so that I can keep peace. You will keep peace as you go the other direction. He hasn't called you to keep peace. He said you have not come to. He's the prince of peace, but he has come to cause trouble. Be ready to cause trouble for Christ. Because when the harvest time comes, if we are not actively seeking a relationship with God, we are drifting away. If we are not in a relationship with God, we are in a relationship with the devil. Listen, if you and God are not like this, but you're close to someone spiritually, you know who you're close to? You're close to the devil. That, that, that is it. To let us not uh, comfort ourselves. If you and God are not like this, you're like this with someone. Two bundles, two destinations. We cannot be in both. Who will you be bundled with at the end of time? Let us rise. It is my prayer that each one of us here today will be found in the bundle of the righteous. In the bundle of those who do not just say, Lord, Lord, but have submitted their lives to the lordship and rulership of Christ. Separation is sure to come. Let us take a moment and reflect and ask ourselves with all honesty, Where do we think we would be bundled today? As we have been growing, have we been imitating the wheat and yet we are tares? Take a moment and ask him to reveal your heart and your place to you. And in the same breath, you go to him in repentance Honest repentance.
Father, that you would have mercy and grace on us. That you would reveal your truth to us in a season where truth is becoming subjective to our feelings, our thoughts, our education, our relationships, Lord. I pray, my Master King of Glory, that you will work in our hearts, Lord, that you draw us to you, my King, that as we seek your face, my King, that we would find you. Father, that we would be found faithful, would found, we would be found planted, growing and blossoming where you have called us. That we will not trade who we are, Lord, that we will boldly embrace where you have planted us, among the wheat, and Father, with pride, with confidence, we will stand tall. That when the time comes for you to separate the wheat and the chaff, my king, that will be found among those that you will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, we exalt you. We worship you. We acknowledge your presence, my king. Give us a heart of discernment, of wisdom, my Lord, to discern, to know, to tell the imitations of the enemy from your truth. That we will not be deceived. That we will not be confused. But Father, that with clarity we will be able to distinguish your voice, your deeds, your call, and your purpose. That we would be true children of the kingdom of God. We give you praise, my king. We give you glory. In Jesus' name. Amen.